and uh, have our office, our section of the office over there. But still, still very much involved in the team and try to get in on the nights of prayer, especially if we're in town. But we'd like to get to know the people. And I wonder if we could just go around and just give your names again and um, say where you're, uh, where you're from. Not that we'll learn it the first time, but we've got to start somewhere. So good, clear name and where you're from. My name is Ronnie Gemmel. I've uh, been living in Scotland for the last three and a half years, originally from Australia. Good. Ronnie Gemmel. My name is Good. Yeah, tell me if uh, some of you are working in other places. Tell where you're working, that's good. Jonathan from Worthing, okay. Dave Goodfell from originally Virginia in the United States, most recently from Columbia, South Carolina. Um, Julia Blanket from the South Coast. Shel Shorn from Vanderbilt, Virginia. Uh, Richie King from Reading Media, England. Dave Ross from Manchester, England. Dave Hollister from the United States. Gary Roo. Roo. Good. Catherine <laughs> Um good. Well, it seems like a very unusual year for uh our international coordinating team that we have so many men we've had years where we hardly had any single men so the Lord always has surprises for us we uh, I think are still praying for one or two or more people uh, maybe the Lord will give them to us are we ready to begin we're already begun I want to just share, and I uh, appreciate your taking some notes because uh, we want you to get these things down. And I think one of the things that you always want to keep in mind is that someday you may have to be giving a similar session, maybe to your own team, maybe out on the mission field somewhere. Everything we share, we want to keep in mind. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I, uh, you know, these things you've heard, faithful men give that to others also. And in working and in, in training individuals, never cease to be amazed the things that they eventually uh, end up asking. Not just things that are very clear, simple matters in the uh, Bible, but all kinds of questions. And certainly one of the great needs in Christian work is for wisdom. I just come from a meeting with the executives of this Bible school, Bible college, and we've just seen, uh, you know, how the enemy tries to bring misunderstanding when two different groups are trying to live together in the same building. Uh, and it was a very, very profitable meeting. And I think because of the wisdom that God gave different people in the meeting, we got through that meeting without it becoming a major uh, rift between uh, OM and the BBI. The enemy is always trying to divide, always trying to bring confusion. And that's why we have these times of orientation and we have quite a few times during the year when there are question and answers and that's why we have Jack Rendell as a team leader who is available not George Verwer who is generally not so available spending over half of my time 
away from uh, London or Bromley. The theme I want to talk about is entitled How and Why This Team, ICT, is a valuable training program. Now, you may be involved in Manchester or Carlisle. Some of these things would be valid there. Most of them would be valid anywhere within Great Britain. We sit back in Bromley and we watch the troops pass through. They share with great excitement, headed for Pakistan, headed for Sudan. They've got their inoculations. They've got their maps. They're showing you where they're going, Bangladesh, the regions beyond. And you're going down Bromley High Street to the station to pick up somebody who's just arrived there and doesn't know how to get up to where we are. So we can understand India, that's a training program, Sudan, that's a training program, but I mean Bromley Kent, training program. And yet because in the past some people have come in there thinking it was just a piece of cake, you know that uh, American expression I guess, thinking it's easy, they have fallen flat on their nose. And it has been interesting to pick them up in the process. Now my message is a little bit geared toward those of you who are non-English. Non-English means Welsh, uh, Scottish, Irish, American. And uh, our team would like to have more English people. We are so happy that our English gentleman, Enid Curry, has agreed to stay on another year, even though behind without me knowing it the Lagos tried to recruit him from underneath our very nose uh, we like to get some English people and it's good to welcome Dirk to the team he's from northern England uh, where they tend to despise London but anyway he's come to London and unfortunately he won't be around there so much as he's working with me uh, my first point is especially relevant because one of the reasons this is a training program is that it is a new culture for many of us. Now, even if you come from rural England, coming into London is, is like a new culture. And deep, different people from different parts of England think quite differently and approach life quite differently. But uh, for those coming from overseas, it is a new culture, so it provides opportunity for cultural identification, for learning, uh, perhaps even some experimentation. Um, there's even a difference in language, and I think you've already had a session pointing out some of the problems of language. Uh, we have people uh, that sometimes are hard to understand. We had a woman from Scotland down on our team some time ago and uh, very difficult for the English to understand what she was saying. I think her problem was linked with not opening her mouth. But uh, I was sitting in a uh, railway station up in Lancashire where I'm going two weeks from now. We have some meetings. Uh, these men were speaking English but I could not understand what they were saying. Anyway, it is an adjustment and therefore it is a fantastic training. If we can't adjust to a culture that is so similar to our own culture, and it is in many ways, then you know, how are we really going to do among Muslims on the Afghan border? Or pygmies in the Congo, or wherever else you're praying about going to. So don't think it's just going to be easy. Um, it is a challenge. We as foreigners can easily offend uh, in Britain. And, of course, it's an area of uh, where we need to grow. Number two, it's a training because it's a new climate. Get these people from sunny California. And they come to England. They've already heard in advance that it's all fog and rain. We get very little fog now in London. I lived in London during the fog smog days. And ever since they brought in smokeless fuel, and by the way, Britain has more rules and regulations than any nation perhaps in the world, 
Uh, they brought in smokeless fuel and a few other changes and uh, you don't get that much fog. Now Sam from Ireland who works in our garage feels that the air in Bromley is bad and polluted but uh, compared to some of the places I've lived in I think the air in Bromley is uh, not so bad. Maybe somebody ought to get one of these gauges measure the air and we can know if we're in the danger zone and wear our masks but um, it is a different climate a lot of people make exaggerations this summer we've had a lot of sunshine uh, we haven't had so much rain during certain weeks but throughout the year it's a little bit dreary for some people never found it much of a problem myself I don't know I, I think somehow Jesus is alive whether it's raining or whether the sun is out and the sunshine is in the heart but it can affect you if you're just running on your natural one little half horsepower engine the weather and all these things change you up and down you go but I really think if we're getting what we need from the Lord then we can adjust to new climates and we can learn how to carry an umbrella or bring a raincoat and uh, make that small adaptation number three it's a training program because of the range of people with whom we work now we are in some ways an international ghetto in Bromley we can't pretend that we're uh, a rural Britannia English crowd we have people from all different countries and I'm sure many people in Bromley don't understand us and so it's a challenge in our meeting here today it was shared how the people around this Bible Institute they don't understand what's going on they don't separate OM from BBI they think BBI has ships uh, and, and uh, interesting little things get said but in missionary work the key far more than geography is relationships learning how to relate to different kinds of people and I think we need to take this as a real challenge and learn to relate to the different people God has given us in Bromley as I'm sure you already know um, we have many many different ministries perhaps if we really weighted up half of all of our work in Bromley on ICT side is OM Britain uh, it's we're linked with Manchester with Carlisle we're under Peter Maiden to take meetings to show hospitality to anybody connected with OM maybe a prayer partner maybe an ex-OMer we're involved in literature distribution in Britain we're involved in evangelism in Britain uh, we're involved in relating to churches and our burden is that the whole work in Britain FFA Arab World ICT STL is one body different teams carrying on different types of work different strategy to some degree but one body so that gives us another opportunity to learn because of course we have to relate with different people who have different purposes in their work maybe different hours of work maybe different a different approach to their work and it'll take you a while to understand that just as if you were going as a new missionary to some country in Africa and Asia it will take you a year at least to begin to understand the ground rules now I'm on a little effort to try to understand cricket and this is a shame this is a sin almost that I've been so long in Britain and don't understand cricket but there are some basic rules you're not going to learn cricket just watching you have to have somebody explain you have to read and um, I need to get into that this year it hasn't been a major priority but now that I'm involved in Pakistan where they are three times more fanatic for cricket than Britain the British gave it to them but I mean there you know you better know what a sticky wicket is and uh, understand cricket I know that term because preachers use it I don't understand what it's about so there's a wide range of people and it's a training program to get to understand these people it's not easy to make in-depth friends in most cultures some cultures superficial friendship is easy other cultures not even that is easy 
But in all cultures, in-depth friendships are more difficult. And one of the challenges for this team is to have some in-depth relationships with British people, not just OM people. And I like the fact that we are not stuck in some missionary headquarters in the middle of the woods. Now, the Lord bless the WEC and their big bolstrode castle out in the middle of the woods and nowhere. I'm sure they can get in cars and drive into London. We are right smack in the middle of a town, and they are watching. There's a little tall building next to us. Now, there's another one gone up. They can literally look out their windows and watch our running back and forth. If you back your vehicle out of the OM garage too fast, and you hit somebody, I tell you, it's going to be maybe in the newspapers. It's going to be talked about all through the building, just like the day we were doing some scrap metal work and junking cars and scrapping cars, and we almost lost our premises as a result of that because it was blocking the pavement. We're in the real world, and uh, we're not isolated in the woods. Even here, we're a bit isolated. It's a monastic-type place. I don't like it, actually, for living long period of time, all right, for four-day retreat. But uh, we're right there, and every move will have its ripples. So it's a great training program because we're called to work with people. We're not called to retire or to monast monasteries. Number four, it's a good place of training because there are lots of pressures. Lots of pressures. You're going to think after a while, too many people trying to do too much with too little in too quick a period of time. Already we're thinking about, you know, the summer crusade. And we're thinking about the, the Mexico Christmas crusade. Well, how does the Mexico Christmas crusade affect our team in Bromley? I'll tell you how it affects it. Every year it takes our leader. Because Jack is committed to be in my place in Mexico so that I can spend more time in Asia. And every time Jack leaves, we usually have a few little interesting difficulties. Jerry Davey usually picks me on the phone, picks up the phone and says, uh, you know, what's going on on the ICT? <laughs> now, Neil Porter has become rather gifted in being the assistant leader, takes over, and usually we survive. But we're very much involved with all kinds of things all over the world. And it creates sometimes pressure on our doorstep. People just arrived. We had somebody phoning the other day. I'm glad I wasn't there. Wanting us to uh, sign the papers so that he could get into England. He's an old friend. He claims that he did a favor for me way back uh, somewhere, so why can't I do a favor for him and sign on the dotted line or give my vouch for him on the telephone so he could be in England for six months or something. All kinds of people. And we want to be able to show them the love of Christ and the ministry of hospitality in our team is not just hospitality house. We've all got to be hospitable. That little house can't handle what we're attempting. I've noticed a tremendous amount of hospitality Peter and Begita Conlon have had over the past weeks. Um, they're over there. People come through. They, they keep them there in their home. And we have many, many others who are involved in the ministry of hospitality. And... Um, it's so important, isn't it, people's first impressions. Say the man who's behind that, that uh, reception desk, the man who's running that little switchboard and, and handling the things that are done there, the post and other things, he's an important person. Because these people coming to Brownlee, they're not going to say me. They're not going to go away, wow, that George Burr is a dynamic revolutionary, written revolution of love, we saw it in action. We arrived and he did this for us and did that for us. No, they're not going to meet me. They're going to meet the guy sitting behind that window. And if he is uh, uptight because someone put salt in his tea or he got woken up too early or the study program didn't agree with him or he's feeling rejected and so he, uh, he lets that irritability out and people can read it. You can, you can read people over the telephone. When you pick up the telephone, sometimes you can tell if that person is, is rattled uh, and I know that um, first impressions are very important. So there are pressures. This provides opportunities for training and for preparation to go on to perhaps somewhere else where there's even more pressure. Bombay, I'm sure, can provide greater pressure. 
Number five, it's a training program because there is a degree of unpredictability. Is that a word? Unpredictability. You never know what next is going to happen in Brahma. Um, we have to be flexible. You're just about to get into a van to go somewhere and Sam comes over head of the garage at present or somebody and says, look, really, <laughs> you can't have this van. Somebody else needs it who has a bigger group. You have to go in this Volkswagen bug with your six and your literature. Um, just the problem of transportation for this number of people when we've got this budget, you know, this budget, we don't have excess money. You say, why don't we have more money in God's work? Well, you, you argue that one out with God all you want. But we don't. We're broke. God does supply. But... Um, the work of God is growing. The problems are great. The need for Bible, the need for literature, the needs for vehicles. In the whole Bombay operation, they don't have a single vehicle. They don't have a single vehicle. They learn to function, therefore, without vehicles. We have vehicles. We have a garage. It's an expensive operation, by the way, if you think it's all cheap. But we have also learned to be very dependent on those vehicles. Each family. And therefore... We're often short of vehicles. And there are a number of other factors that make it a little bit unpredictable at times. We need advanced planning. There are planning meetings going on all the time. But sometimes, even after planning something, an unpredictable factor comes. I remember one year, all of a sudden, Fred Perry and his whole family land on our doorstep. What are we going to do? He's laboring in Iran. He had to leave Iran because of the war. He arrives back. In the international uh, uh, office of OM he said, well, no, I'm sorry. You know, it's nice of you to be here, but uh, we don't want you. Uh, you have to welcome a missionary when he returns from the field. They have the sense that they're missionaries returning to their home base. Now, the home base of OM is actually many places. It's New Jersey, Manchester, ICT, it's Mosbach. But for them at that time, they're not interested in Mosbach in New Jersey. They're there and they're hoping they may get a place to sleep, they may get something to drive, and they might even get a place to live in for a while before, until they find out where they should be going. So the unpredictableness, which demands flexibility and adaptability, and I always remember from my missionary lectures in Bible college, flexibility, adaptability. You know one of the problems in missionary work is that people coming from highly sophisticated cultures where there's a heavy emphasis on education, America's in that camp, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, many, many countries are in that camp. When they go to the mission field, they don't find a slot for their particular training. Even someone who's been trained in computers what kind of training in computers? What kind of computer? I mean, you could be trained in computers and be recruited into a computer job and you might as well almost be at zero. Totally different machine, totally different program, uh, different kinds of demands being made on you. And that's why they often say a good missionary is a jack of all trades. He can repair his own car. I'm sure all of you can do that. We need such people in ICT. Dirk was sharing with me that he didn't feel he had much gift yet in that area. Uh, he knows how to repair things around the house because we don't have miracle men. You just phone up and they just come in and repair everything. We have a maintenance crew. You never, they never seem to catch up. We're a lot of old houses. There are many of us. And it's not easy to find people to give a year to going around repairing other people's houses and, and uh, unstopping drains and we called the special squad in once to rescue my toilet they managed to smash the entire toilet and everything running around and, uh, you know that was after we had in the professional plumber the professional plumber he was worse praise God for people that are willing to do that kind of work because without them some of us would not be taking the meetings which bring in the recruits, which bring in a lot of other things. So it's, it's teamwork. It's teamwork. And we praise God for that teamwork. And it's a learning experience. And maybe the Lord wants you to develop some new abilities this year. 
If you could learn how to change a punctured tire rather than just phoning for the tire puncture, that's a flat puncture squad. Uh, amazing. Then number six, I've already got into it without realizing it, the many different kinds of jobs, meetings, handling books, hospitality, serving people, personal evangelism, literature distribution, all kinds of areas that you can, you can sharpen up. Say, well, anybody can do those things. Yeah. Not many people know how to set up a proper book table in a meeting. The difference between one man setting it up and another man setting up could be 100 pounds easily. 100 pounds easily. In fact, some people, they, they easily get discouraged when they try to set up a book table. The man says, well, we don't allow books to be sold on Sunday. So he packs it all in the, the box and puts it in the back of the van. Instead of perhaps thinking, well, could we put just two, two books out uh, and, and just give them on a donation basis? Oh, well, we'll meet with the elders and see. They decide we can do that. Actually, we have spread that philosophy in the last 15 years all over the country. I'm glad it's not our first year. So learning how to set up a book table, learning some of these other basic skills, right down to such practical things as driving in England, which is not like driving in the United States or Sweden. They used to drive on that side of the road in Sweden. I remember when they changed sides in Sweden some years ago. And one day, everything suddenly changed overnight. And there were accidents and people were driving into lakes and who knows what else was happening. But in England, they... Uh, they, they very much resist certain kinds of change. Decimalization, it was looked at as a giant dragon spewing out its head from the common market. And uh, now they're trying to get us to think in liters. Most petrol stations still have gallons and liters. And I was in England when that famous day we switched from shillings, pounds, and pence to just pounds and pence. And uh, my people were spewing out venom and crusading down the streets and resisting these changes. But changes do come, even in England. And uh, if you visit such tradi traditional places as Cambridge University and see all the students sitting there in a row for their evening meal and all the people sitting on the high table and they open in prayer and all this, you realize what a nation of fantastic traditions and they consider, many of them, those of us coming from uh, America is just naive. Uh, and our nation is so young, we barely know how to put our tr trousers on yet. And so we must walk with much humility. You talk about, you know, an old building, you know, a hundred years old in America. They put a big sign on it, <laughs> the Preservation Act. <laughs> but uh, some of you may be living in hundred-year-old buildings. They'll be tearing down in the next couple of months. So there are many kinds of jobs, lots of opportunity to get thrown into new things. Therefore, it's, it's a good training program. <coughs> the seventh reason it's a training program is because there's a lot of boring, dull, routine work. And missionary work is loaded with boring, dull, routine things, even in India driving that old truck from Kerala to Kathmandu five days uh, I tell you it's boring it may sound like an adventure back here just do it and in mission work today you can't live on the spectacular it's not big crusades and great meetings and revivals springing up overnight through 20 minutes of prayer there's a lot of slogging there's a lot of routine we need to learn faithfulness in routine things. Maybe caring for our vehicle. Maybe caring for property. We have a lot of people giving us temporary use of their homes. And I tell you, if we leave those homes in worse shape than when we received them, except in some, maybe some exceptional cases, we hear about it. It seems very hard for people to understand in London what a miracle this accommodation is that we have. We are living in an area where every square foot is worth pounds. Every little room is worth 10, 20, 30 pounds a week, a week. 
And we all want to stay on minimum prayer target in Iran. You know, we couldn't even raise this after seven hours of debate and discussion with the leaders. You have to have the minimum prayer target. The British have to up it a little bit because they've been so far behind with the international figure. So those of you from Britain, as a year from now, the figure will be a little higher. Fact is, in Britain, we can't survive on this minimum figure, not really, if we count all the expenses. So we like to encourage people to be more realistic in their praying. And I hope, however feeble your accommodation is, you'll give thanks to the Lord and take care of it. Take care of it. A house, a small house in London, is 50 to 70 to 80 pounds sterling per week. I mean, people are just going wild trying to find accommodation. We've had to cut our Arab world team right down. We just haven't been able to find it. We say, Lord, why is this? And uh, a lot of the uh, immigrants who come into Britain take a house and they just divide it up. People are living in one little room with a whole family in London. They're trying to stop this, but they are, with a little kitchen, and they're paying ex exorbitant rents. The rent system at present in England is against the renter and in favor of the landlord. The laws, the basic rules, makes it very complex. Makes it a hard country to rent in. So a lot of our accommodation is very unique. And we need people who are willing to try to keep it cared for. Number eight, the eighth reason why this is a training program is exposure. Now, not just because we're in England, but because we're on ICT, we get terrific exposure, all kinds of missionary leaders. We get more visiting speakers, more missionary leaders than most teams. We can learn from these people. One of the men, who the moment he left ICT, he went into quite, a, quite an important leadership position, but when he was on ICT, he was just picking people up from the airport. But he had a very positive attitude toward that. He didn't think of that, oh, no, another trip to the airport. He thought it as an opportunity. He just listened to cassette tapes going out and listened to the people he picked up coming back or vice versa if he was taking somebody out. He met a lot of interesting people. And they became friends uh, in some cases. So we get a lot of exposure. We have the audiovisual department with all kinds of interesting films and uh, videos. We have exposure to a wide range of cassettes and books and tapes and magazines. This is what little research we have on an international level. It was based on this team. It's a department that is greatly weakened because we don't have anybody full-time in research. But if you want to find out something about almost any subject, uh, you, you, you'll be amazed what we have in Bromley. So that, to me, is a great challenge. It makes Bromley a great stepping stone into other fields. A representative of almost every field in OM will eventually pass through Bromley. And if you're interested, you can get to them. You have to sometimes take the initiative. And then the ninth reason that it's a training program right there in good old Bromley in London uh, is because there's terrific scope for evangelism. I was telling the India group that, you know, if they just want to go do personal work and small group work, there's no purpose going to India. They can do that right in England. You need to go to India for personal work. We've got more Indians everywhere we, we look in London. Now, that I was in the process at that time of giving them the challenge to reach the masses, which is the part of our strategy for the subcontinent. And to reach the masses, then we're going to have to go there. But there's fantastic opportunities for witness. And in 29 years of trying to get people into evangelism, I have discovered that it is not easy. And Jack has discovered this, who has oftentimes been a tremendous example on our team in the area of evangelism. He had piles of other things to do, trudging out Saturday morning, door to door, giving out tracts. And I think this is an area where people easily get disappointed. They somehow picture that when it comes to evangelism, oh, and it's really got it all together. Even though 50% of all the people every year are new, and even though the leaders, and we do have some very gifted leaders in this, they're spread out over 35 nations, and they're not always attractive to Bromley, uh, plus many other factors. 
I can assure you, make it very clear that we don't have in Bromley a lot of hyper-motivated, hyper-gifted people in evangelism. In fact, often it's a newcomer to the team, like Steve Davis a couple years ago, who really added a new dimension to our team. Because in evangelism and OM in general, we sometimes get into a rut. Door to door, giving out tracks at the railway station. Uh, and then, you know, it's good to get some new ideas. Don't just think in terms of the official time once or twice a week when there's evangelism, but may your whole life be evangelism. May you have uh, literature in your pockets. Uh, may you be ready for a word of testimony lovingly. I think when it comes to Bromley itself, mass distribution doesn't need to be our main method, but certainly down in London, there's a chance to reach masses of people that if you don't give them that tract in London, they're often just passing through to the Muslim world or passing through to some other country. If you don't give them that tract, nobody will. And when I was in London more and, uh, in a different situation, I used to go into central London all the time just give out tracts. I used to carry them in many languages and found it very, very challenging. We used to have family day, take the children with us and do that. So there's great opportunity for evangelism, door to door, street work, working with the Arab team, working with churches, and I'm sure that will be presented. And I hope you'll take advantage of it. Because, you know, I think a lot of uh, talk about evangelism in OM is, is, is so much hot air. If it's not real to you right there in Bromley, how real is it going to be in Bombay? Or in the middle of the Muslim world? And I just think it's a challenge to be involved in evangelism in our own home area or what may appear to be a home area. We easily drop our guard when we're in a place like Bromley. It doesn't seem like the mission field. We don't see demon-possessed people running down the street as you do in Calcutta. Uh, you don't trip over a beggar or a leper as you step outside the door in Bromley. You might encounter a drunk now and then. And therefore, we, we were deceived. But I will tell you, basically, the city of London is in the hands of the evil one. Sunday morning, sometimes I go into uh, the huge, giant uh, market up in the East End and just talk to people and give out literature. It's unbelievable. The lasses on Sunday morning, they're not in church, come into that market looking for a bargain and uh, to go up there and just see it. Uh, it's quite, quite a challenge. And then lastly, God tests us in ways that we do not expect. That's why really ever since your conversion you were in God's training program. And the fact that you're geographically in Bromley rather than West Bengal doesn't mean God is now hindered in his program to train you because uh, he can test you. We don't know what's going to happen in England. As you know, in England, in the years gone by, we've had terrorism. You remember last summer when that huge bomb went off, not far from where some of our people were, killing all those people and all those horses. It's in the press all over the world. We're not in a country with total stability. Well, compared to many parts of the world, I believe Britain is a haven of peace. And my flesh, the human side of me, is actually very happy in Britain. Uh... You can get so much done. The phones work. The trains run on time. The buses are there. There's taxis. There's rent-a-cars. There's unlimited facilities compared to most nations. Now, if you have come from one other very developed nation to Britain, another developed nation, then you won't, you won't notice this. You see, I've lived four years in India, six months a year, and I've lived in Nepal and Bangkok. You ever try to get across Bangkok? And I live in Africa a little bit. And I tell you, when you come back to Britain, you realize this country is an ideal launching pad to get equipment, machinery, people out to the ends of the earth. It is a fantastic coordinating base for an international movement like OM. We have the most international airport in the world right down the road. Notice how many people even come here to Belgium. All go through London. All through London. We are at the hub. And now we can drive from Bromley to Dover in an hour and a half. For years of praying for that motorway to bypass those villages and bypass Canterbury. And it's there now, almost complete. And it's another hour 
off the time to Dover, which means using the hovercraft, it's five or six hours from Bromley to Leuven. Um, God has put us in a very key place. He's provided us accommodation. He's provided us a fantastic warehouse, garage. There are facilities. With that, we have a lot of friends, friends giving us equipment, friends lending us services. Ian Curry was sharing with me, one man has given us thousands of pounds of services, equipment. And that's something we need to learn in Bromley, how to get other people involved. You know, people want to get involved in helping OM, but they don't know how to take the initiative. Or they may be afraid of us. They think we're super spiritual. And as we get people involved, we become friends, we get them into some of those nights of prayer, and we've often been very weak in this area. I tell you, lives are going to be changed. And we're going to see more people from those local Bromley churches where we're hoping you're going to get involved not only coming to the prayer meetings, but getting involved with us in evangelism or we with them and, and even joining OM on the year program. When I arrived in Britain, somebody said to me, Britain's a mission field. Every nation's a mission field. Some of Britain's greatest evangelists have gone to evangelize America. And it's wonderful that the British people welcomed Billy Graham and Louise Palau and many lesser lights to come back and help with the task in Britain because there's only 10% or 12% going to church and that's up, climbed up in the last 12 years. That includes everybody, Roman Catholic, Jehovah Witnesses, Spiritists, the works. The number of born-again evangelicals in Britain, most people would put at maybe a million out of 50 plus million people. Some would say that's an exaggeration. But one thing we know, if there are a million born-again evangelical Christians in Britain, Considering the rest of Europe, we have the greatest manpower source in Europe for getting workers and prayer. And as I think you probably know, in a miraculous way, God has given OM a tremendous credibility with other Christian groups. And we have open doors. I just had my invitation for Cambridge University again for 1984. Uh, we have people asking us to take more meetings sometimes almost than we can take. And so this provides a great open door and gives us many opportunities to work with people and to mobilize people. I might only ask that I think this training program is made more interesting by the fact that we have another unique team of Christians right next to us, SPL. Very different kind of work with very different historic roots. They are long before we were. I am in Bromley traditionally because of SPL, not ICT. ICT didn't exist. It was just uh, myself and a secretary. So I, uh, I think it's a great challenge when we have another team. We work together on some things, we play together, but we have very unique tasks. And there's some overlapping, but there's some areas where we agree. This is your task, this is our task, let's not get in a lot of Baluba-duba talking about it, but let's get on with it. And this is beautiful because what's one of the biggest problems on the mission field? Mission societies that can't get on with a mission society down the road, and it's a heartbreak on the mission field, and it's a stumbling block, often to the unconverted. And I've often thought if we somehow can't get on with our own brothers and sisters and STL and esteem them and work with them and learn how to resolve our problems, and they're always problems, and you know, what are we going to do? We work side by side with a national Pakistani mission society in Karachi. Totally different ideas, strategies, salary system, or whatever else. So that also provides challenge and preparation for missionary work overseas or wherever the Lord may lead you. Now, don't think that this, what I've touched in this brief hour, uh, covers our ministries. Uh, if you listen to the message I gave the other night on the dynamic headquarters, then you'll know what our ministry is. Fifteen major ministries were shared. I've had incredibly positive feedback from that meeting, even from uh, some of my leaders who don't always have time to write feedback. So if you want to know in general what the ministry of almost any ON HQ is or base uh, then uh, I trust you were in that meeting. It didn't get recorded, so I'm going to have to give it again sometime. 
as a number of people have requested it. Well, there we are, right on the hour, Jack. You want to take a few minutes for questions? Yeah, that'd be good. Or is there a next?